We're going to turn to uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7 in particular. We've taken two readings, one from the last part of Hebrews 4 and into the first part of chapter 5, and then also the last few verses of Hebrews 7 and the first six from Hebrews chapter 8. And all of these things relate to our superior high priest, Jesus Christ. And uh, we need to say much about him today, but as we come to say those things, we'll just give ourselves to a moment of prayer and uh, just ask for the Spirit's attention to our hearts. Let's pray together. Uh, dear Father, today we have much to say about your Son. And we know, Father, that you love your Son and in him your glory has been revealed to us. And we pray as we speak of his ministry as our great high priest, the one whom you've appointed by your own hand to be priest over us. We pray, Father, that you would help us increasingly to love your son, to honour him, to worship him and to adore him. And that honour and love and worship and adoration, Father, is joy and life to our souls and brings glory and joy, so to speak, to your own heart. So, Father, as we speak of him today, send freshly the Spirit among us to make his name and work known. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When we were talking about the priesthood of Christ a couple of weeks ago, we said uh, we needed to speak about that priesthood because we needed a high priest. Uh, you cannot face God in the last day <clears throat> if there be no high priest. And we need one who will abide forever to be a priest for us because the issues that we face in life are beyond just our transient time, however long the Lord may give us to live on this earth. And then we also said we need only one priest. Uh, let no other man or woman seek to be a priest between us and God. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And when we, in whatever form, seek to uh, take that priesthood to ourselves, we tread on very holy ground, which is very wrong for us to take to ourselves and we interfere with the direct priesthood of Christ to the heart of another person. And that becomes very messy, very wrong. <clears throat> and if we had to summarise the aim of today's message and today's service, it's simply this, that you would be enabled today to have confidence to leave this service, so to speak, with confidence for your future forever on the basis of who's your priest. <clears throat> Don't think that we could leave and have confidence on some other basis. The only confidence on which we can have, only basis on which we can have confidence is because of who Christ is and in particular because of who he is as our priest and there's Half a dozen things we need to say about that today. <clears throat> but let me just try and focus the matter for you. We could run through the passage that we've read today and we could pick out certain points that talk about the superiority of the priesthood of Christ and we could all go from here saying, well, now that's really good because I know six things about the priesthood of Christ that I didn't realise before. But from one level it might still leave you untouched. <clears throat> the writer to the Hebrews is writing to a particular congregation who have a particular setting and that setting is 
very deeply contested and there's much suffering attending their Christian path and he was not writing to them to give them six pieces of information and three schemas to understand the priesthood. He's writing to them so that they would seize the hope that was set before them. And so the purpose of our gathering together to hear this word expounded for us today is that we might leave seizing the hope that is set before us. And try and focus that a little by saying, <clears throat> let's just imagine that you had nothing to look forward to. Let's just do a small mental exercise and remove from your mind, remove from your mind and your heart, anything to look forward to. Uh, you can start close if you like, like start with lunch. <laughs> and then you can move out from there. Nothing to look forward to beyond lunch. Nothing to look forward to in terms of life, family. Nothing that you can somehow look forward to with expectancy of blessing and assurance. And you suddenly discover when there's nothing like that to look forward to that you need hope. You need something to look forward to. And it's no accident that uh, business leaders and generals and people who command people have worked that out. And so they try and provide a way in which you can have that. They're called mission statements and vision statements. And then you set up protocols for fulfilling those through policy and strategy. And But from a secular point of view, you could say it's all looking for hope. Try to have a hope. And if the church won't have the hope of its high priest, then it will have to go down that route. But even try and reframe the question and perhaps bring it more to where these people to whom the writer is writing, bring it right down to where they are. Just This is not being morbid on a sunny Sunday morning. But every person here in this congregation, every person here is going to die. Every person that you ever meet is going to fade away. Everything you ever work for, all of the things that you produce in life, the career that you work so hard to develop, everything that we attach hope and expectation to is going to fade away, it's going to die, it's going to crumble, it's going to return to the dust. Now we may think theoretically about that. These people were not focused with a th faced with a theory that things might get tough or that they might die. Some of them were already in prison. Some of them have already had their property confiscated and taken away for the sake of the gospel. Their property had been plundered. So where is a hope that transcends that? Where is a hope that transcends what we put our hope in on this life? Where is a hope that transcends even death itself? Where is that hope? And the writer of the Hebrews is saying, you have that hope, but don't think about that hope that transcends all of those things in terms of a system of thought or a system of theology. All of that hope is Christ. He alone is the confidence that we have for the future that God has promised us, but it's only in him and it's not in any of those things. And if we think it is going to be in those things, then the hope of Christ on the one hand will grow dim and those things will become strangely alluring to us. And where they have become strangely alluring to us and we start to feed on them as though we can gain our hope from them, then Christ seems to diminish in our love and our affections and our experience and our worship. And where Christ seems to diminish suddenly we're going backwards, not forwards. 
And suddenly we need a warning. Hear what you're being told, the writer to the Hebrew says. Listen to what's being said. Do not keep going backwards. And don't try and put something else in place to stop you going backwards. Don't try and put a symptomatic treatment for backward sliding in place. The only person who can keep you moving ahead is Christ. So that's why there is so much in this letter about him. There is no other boast that a believer has. There is no other confidence that we have. And in this passage that we've read from Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26 down to 8 verse 6, there are six things, half a dozen things that he tells us about Christ which we need to hold to be secured in the superiority of his priesthood. First one we've already spoken about a couple of weeks ago. You can pick it up in verse uh, 28 of chapter 7. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. And the point that the writer makes much of, which we spent some time looking at two weeks ago, was the perpetuity of the priesthood of Christ because of the power of his indestructible life. He speaks in verse 23 of the, the former priests who on the one hand existed in great numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently, therefore he's able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. There is a priesthood in heaven on our behalf which is based on the power of an indestructible life. So, as we said a couple of weeks ago, if his life is indestructible, it means that he has overcome sin because death comes through sin. And if he's overcome death, sin must have been put out of action. And if he's overcome sin, then our guilt is taken away. If he's overcome guilt and the wrath of God is removed, then the power of Satan is broken. So if there is at the right hand one perpetually interceding for us because of the power of his indestructible life, that priesthood is going to be superior to anything that we can put in place here from within our own selves or from our own resources because none of us in ourselves have an indestructible life. None of us. The only life that we have that is indestructible is his life. And so the writer makes much of the fact that this indestructible priesthood of Christ abides forever, Christ abides forever, and that superiority of his perpetual priesthood uh, puts him head and shoulders, if we could use that, word, that phrase, above any of the earthly priests who've ever lived. But the second thing that we need to notice about this priesthood, it's not just its perpetuity, but its perfect humanity. If you look at verse 26 of chapter 7, for it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, and then he, then he describes him, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and that has a consequence verse 27 he does not need daily like those high priests to offer up the sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people he does not need to do that because he had no sins of his own for which he needed to offer sacrifices now in the old testament the priesthood was there so that people may understand god's mercy to them as a nation the Levitical priesthood was a teaching function. The Levitical priesthood was also a sacrificial function. And through the Levitical priesthood, there was always a testimony in word and in action of God's grace and mercy and his covenant love and his long-suffering 
patience with his people. There was also a testimony to the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the provision that he made for sins to be forgiven. And ideally, those priests were to be people of great human sympathy and tenderness. They did not take the role to themselves out of pride, as we've read in Hebrews chapter 5. They were commanded by God to do that. And those who needed to could draw near to a priest and that priest would mercifully understand them because they themselves were beset with weaknesses. But they were sinful. Every one of them was sinful. And the ideal that was there in place in the Old Testament was not always enacted. In some of the intertestamental periods, we read of the priests who became very greedy, rapacious. You only have to look in the New Testament to find people like Caiaphas as high priest that year. And the position of high priest had become politicised, <coughs> become a means by which wealth could be obtained and power could be exercised. So eventually out of that mishmash you come, well, it's expedient for one man to die. Caiaphas, even in his expediency, spoke as a prophet, but he didn't, knew it, didn't know it. It is reported that Napoleon has said, I'm surrounded by priests who tell me that their kingdom is not of this world. But meantime, they lay their hands on everything they can get. And if that's true, if that is what Napoleon said, it's a true statement anyway. That the former priests existed in great numbers because they all died. The fact that they died was evidence that they themselves were touched not just by infirmity but by the guilt of sin. And even in Israel, even in God's covenanted people, the priesthood often became a means for selfish gain and a means for exercising political power. <clears throat> so you don't want a priest, finally, who is sinful. You may think, if we have a priest who's holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, he can't understand me. No, if you have a priest who's not holy, not undefiled, who is a sinner and who somehow is not separated from us, then he is finally of no use to you. Because he would then be trapped in the whole morass of human sin. The priests themselves were intermediaries, <coughs> but intermediaries for themselves as much as for their people. They made sacrifices first for themselves. And if you have a priest over you who is subject to human sin, then you can have no confidence, finally, that his priesthood is going to endure in purity. If he's subject to human sinfulness, what happens if he turns nasty? Like Caiaphas. So there needs to be a priest over us who is perfect in his humanity and God in Christ has provided that and because of that perfection of his humanity there's a power in his sacrifice that the other priests would, the other priests could never offer if you go down to verse 27 he does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. He has offered a sacrifice which is an irrepeatable sacrifice because of who the victim is. While there was a procession of priests you needed a procession of lambs. But when you've got a priest who is the lamb, you only need one. Because of who he is, holy, spotless, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, he can be and is the lamb of God. 
And so by virtue of that sacrifice, the once for allness of his ministry is secured and there need not be, indeed cannot be, any other sacrifice for sin apart from that sacrifice. And so the writer to the Hebrews says it's once and for all. Once meaning it does not need to be repeated. For all meaning that all the people of God for all time can, be, can live free of the need for sacrifices. Either in actual terms, hence the Old Testament system could fade away and it still be biblical and right and God given that it does fade away. We don't need to offer those. But mentally, psychologically, there is a thing called a guilt payoff, isn't there? You get a little bit of guilt, you do something to pay it off. That guilt payoff is a sacrifice. And every time we engage in a guilt payoff sacrifice, we are in some sense attempting to have another access to God that is other than priest, the high priest Christ. There is a once for all sacrifice for sin. So the perpetuity of his priesthood is the first basis of his superiority, the perfection of his humanity, and because of that the power of his sacrifice. The next one you might not have picked up, but we could put it this way. The terms of his appointment. Chapter 7, verse 28. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. What word of the oath is he talking about? He's talking about the oath that he swore to Melchizedek, verse 20 of chapter 7, and inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they became priests without an oath, but he with an oath, through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. So much more also, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. <clears throat> Remember what the writer had said about the Lord swearing with an oath to, under, to underline and to secure in our experience the absolute uh, foundational nature of his promises, the fact that you can build your life on those promises. They're secured by an oath and it's impossible for God to lie. A, that he makes a promise in the first place. B, that he secures it with an oath. And the writer to the Hebrews is saying that first priesthood did not come with that sort of oath. And indeed, you can look through the whole of the institution of the Levitical priesthood and you won't find it. There's a better appointment. The terms of appointment are superior. That was an arrangement that the priests had in place which was entirely dependent upon the covenant in which they operated, but God before that covenant was in place and after that covenant with, was in place swore an oath that there would be a priest of a different order and because of the nature of that oath and the impossibility of God to lie in making that oath, this priest is a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And he appoints, God appointed men in that old system <coughs> who are weak and sinful to act as intermediaries. But now he's appointed a son made perfect forever. Sonship <coughs> trumps Levitical priesthood every time. The fifth reason why this priesthood is superior is a rule that you'll recognise from real estate. What is it? The three things that you need about selling your house? Location, location, location. And why is this priesthood of Christ superior? And the writer is going to tell us in chapter 7, and chapter 8, and chapter 9, and chapter 10. It's location, location, location. Because those priests in the Old Testament ministered in an earthly sanctuary which was an earthly copy of a heavenly original. 
But it was a copy. It was not the real thing. You could enter into that Old Testament sanctuary and because of God's causing his name to dwell there and because of the fact that it all bore testimony to him, you're actually in the presence of God and the dwelling place of his name, but it was still a copy of what Moses was shown in heaven. It was a copy of the heavenly sanctuary. It's a copy of the dwelling place of God. It's a copy of the throne of God, copy of the mercy and the seat of God. It's a copy of everything that God is in himself. It was all represented on the earth, but what was on the earth was a copy of what was there, and Christ is there, he's not on the earth. That's why in chapter 6 the anchor goes up, not down. Because you need to be anchored in the reality of the thing that the copy was made from. And because he's in that heavenly realm, beyond time, beyond earthly limitations of place, the tabernacle was at a place, it moved around, but it was still in a place. The temple was in a place. It didn't move around, but it was still in a place. Now the place in which Jesus operates as the high priest is heavenly, above all heavens and above the earth, into the very throne room and very presence of God. And because of that location, he is able to operate as a priest with full effectiveness. The main point of what we've been saying is this, verse 1 of chapter 8. We have such a high priest who's taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Taken his seat, his work of sacrifice is finished. A minister in the sanctuary and the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man, then he goes on to show that these other priests operated in the earthly sanctuary. And indeed, if Jesus were operating in the earthly sanctuary, he wouldn't be a priest because he didn't come from the tribe of Levi. But these, verse 5, serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Moses was warned to make everything that he made according to the pattern. So Moses was shown in that revelation in heaven the absolute centre of the whole of God's plan and purpose. He's shown the very throne room of heaven itself and the tabernacle below was a copy of that. And he is now operating in that heavenly reality forever. And then sixthly, his priesthood is superior because it serves a better covenant. Verse 6 of chapter 8, he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he's become the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. Now the writer is going to make a lot of that in the rest of chapter 8 and into chapter 9 so we won't make much of it just now. But just remember what we said a couple of weeks ago that there's an indivisible unity between four things. Covenant, law, Worship and priesthood. You change one, you've got to change them all. If you touch covenant, you've got to touch priesthood and worship and so forth. How can there be a passing away of that whole system which for centuries and centuries and centuries had been the worship life of the people of God because there has to be a new covenant on which a new worship in a new temple with a new priesthood is based. The writer of the Hebrews says you've got a superior priest, not simply because of the perpetuity of his priesthood, but the perfection of his person, the power of his sacrifice, the terms of his appointment, the location in which he ministers, and the covenant on the basis which is the basis of that ministry. So why do we emphasize those things? Why are these things important? The answer is this, these are six transcendent realities. They're going to outlast you. They're going to outlast everything that you touch. They're going to outlast every person you know. And because they're rooted in eternity and grounded in heaven, they outlast all your circumstances 
They're bigger and stronger, thank God, than your emotional life. We've developed a new way of knowing things in the West, which is very, very damaging. The new way of knowing is, I feel, therefore it is. Biblically, it is. I wouldn't even say, therefore I feel. Biblically it is, therefore I believe. And because you believe, you act. And then you might feel something along the way. There's a poem, I can't remember the full part of it, but one part of it said, <clears throat> Today I had a feeling, it lasted half an hour. <laughs> I hope again tomorrow it will come with more power. Can be so transient, can't they, our emotional life? If you only to root and ground your Christian experience in your emotional life, Lord help us. Depend on what you've had for brekkie. But these things are six transcendent realities. They are bigger than anything within you. They are bigger than you. They are bigger than the whole span of your life. They're bigger than the span of everyone's life who ever's lived in the world. They are eternal realities. <clears throat> Therefore, you can have confidence. What if your circumstances change? What if you lose your job? What if our property is plundered? What if some of us are thrown into prison for the sake of the gospel, as many of our brothers and sisters are around the world? Where's your confidence if all the things in which we normally place our trust is gone? Where's your hope? Well, you need a priest who's beyond all of the things in which you normally place your hope. And the writer of the Hebrews is saying, Beloved friends, you have such a high priest. So don't get too fussed about your circumstances in life. Don't get too worried about whether you think you're rich or whether you think you're poor, whether your property is intact or whether it's not, whether you're well or whether you're healthy, whether you feel good or whether you feel down. Don't get too fussed about whether you're liked or whether you're not, whether you're persecuted or not, because you've got a high priest in heaven who loves you and he's interceding for you. I guess one of the things that we've learned over the years in our own life, if you can forgive the personal reference, but also in years of pastoral ministry is this, that if a person does not abandon themselves entirely to that priesthood, it's always going to be a battle in the wrong sense of the word. Because you're always going to have to have some other means by which your hope is secured. The writer to the Hebrews is saying, no, you can abandon your cause to him fully and completely and absolutely and without reservation because of the superior nature of the priesthood. And it means you don't need a go-between between God and your own self. You've already got one mediator who understands everything that he needs to know about you. Isn't that great? Going to pray and then sing before we lean into the Lord's Supper. Father, we thank you that you have appointed your Son, made perfect forever, fitted for the task of being a high priest. We thank you for the security and for the utter confidence that we have because of him. Pray, Father, that you would lift our eyes up to see the hope that is secured for us in Christ, that we may seize it and desist from consulting our own opinions and our own emotions and live by faith in Christ in whom we act, in Jesus' name.